Coming up, the truth about your automatic transmission. Is it really sealed for life? And if it's not, what is a rational basis for changing that fluid and extending the service life of this extremely expensive automotive component? I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. You can hit me up on the website for that, of course, but that's not specifically why I'm here today. I just want to save you a few dollars today if you're a car owner, like maybe 15 or even 20 grand in extremis, because frankly, that's what a catastrophic transmission failure is going to cost you in a modern heavy-duty vehicle. And Nobody wants that in the lead up to Christmas, on the worst year on record, or at any other time, just to be realistic about it. So, just to wrap our brains around the fundamental thermodynamic distinction between the two things that we're going to talk about, we've got heat and temperature, and they're different. Thermometers measure temperature, it's just kind of how hot something is, but heat is a form of energy, and the two relate to each other basically like this. You've got heat going into the transmission, which is essentially generated internally, from things like churn in the converter, because the torque converter is a big fat fluid drive unit that churns a hell of a lot of slippery fluid to make that drive go from the engine to the input shaft of the transmission. And that generates a lot of heat thanks to internal friction in the fluid. But there's also friction in the clutches, which generates heat, and let's face it, the reason for soaking clutches in oil is to dissipate the heat into the oil so that it can be dealt with a little bit later on. That just makes sense, okay? And there's also bearings and gears, which people don't give enough thought to either, because the thing keeping the metal parts apart in anything that's got a bearing in it or whatever is just a thin film of oil. And that means the two metal parts don't touch each other, but the consequence of those parts being very close together and exerting a lot of pressure is internal friction, like shear forces within the oil, and that generates a lot of heat as well. So all of this heat goes into the parts of the transmission, hence input heat, okay? And then there's heat loss, because the transmission's like a big aluminium and or steel box that's being shoved into an airstream at 80 or 100 k's an hour, and therefore it's subjected to a great deal of convective cooling, okay? It might also have a transmission cooler that does some heat loss as well. But the basic thing is, if the heat going in is greater than the heat going out, then the temperature increases, okay? And this is what happens when you start your car and begin driving it, okay? The transmission warms up, just like everything else. And you get to a point where heat going in equals heat going out, and the temperature is constant. And what we want to do in this report is keep that temperature at a safe level to preserve the integrity of the fluid and not damage the parts inside the transmission. So it's kind of important to figure this out. And obviously, when you get to a hill that requires you to overcome a gravity component pushing you back the other way, the engine works harder, it pushes harder on the transmission, the churn gets bigger, the clutches do more work, there's more friction on the bearings and the gears, and the heat input goes up, the heat loss is probably fairly similar, and therefore the temperature rises when you do this sort of hard work, right? When you put a trailer on the back of your car and you've got all of that additional aerodynamic drag of your transparent, acoustically transparent, transparent and transparent aluminium chitois taking it all over the nation, transmission's going to be hotter. And that kind of thing kills a lot of transmissions. Hashtag Australia. This is going to be very controversial indeed, you know, if you are one of these beard-stroking gentlemen who likes to get their, let's call it, information from online forums in which other beard-stroking gentlemen, you know, give you their opinion, I'm going to depart from the domain of opinion here and go with the facts. And I know this is controversial and somebody should shoot me for suggesting such a heretical thing in the 21st century, but let's do it anyway, all right? Read the owner's manual. There's a revolutionary suggestion because the manufacturer might have advice for you about 
operating your vehicle in extreme situations, such as getting a big aluminium, acoustically transparent chitois and hooking it up to your four-wheel drive and driving it across the desert or the Nullarbor or something at 100 k's an hour because this places additional stresses on the machine. And the manufacturer might have noted that in R&D and come up with a countermeasure that you can deploy, such as turning the overdrive off. I think Toyota recommends that for some Prados and perhaps other vehicles. I don't really know, but I've heard that and I haven't done the research to confirm it. But if you've got an owner's manual, read it. Read the towing section and see what they say. Some Subarus certainly recommend a VMAX for towing, 80 k's an hour if memory serves. And these countermeasures can be easily implemented by you and they sideline the risk of a catastrophic transmission failure prematurely that might cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Yes. So there's a good incentive to get, do something nobody does statistically. Read the friggin' manual and then actually measure the transmission operating temperature. And if you're going to do this, do it as a worst case scenario, okay? So get your big chitois and load it, hook it up, load the vehicle, make sure it's legal but heavily loaded, wait for a really, really hot day and then go for a drive up a hill or something at 80 or 100 k's an hour and do it for a long enough period to get meaningful data. And don't do anything crackpot like drill a hole in the side of the transmission case and insert a thermocouple or have some sort of mad science experiment there's a much easier way to do it, okay? And I'd recommend you procure for yourself via Amazon or something of that nature, one of these little Bluetooth dongles that plugs in. I don't know how well you can see that, but probably reasonably well. It just plugs in to the OBD2 port of your car, the onboard diagnostics port. People mistake what that is, right? The OBD2 port is really a port with a communication standard attached to it for data, which means that a dongle like this can just be plugged into essentially any car with that port, and the data can be meaningful to the dongle, and then you just get the app, right, that goes with it. There's a free app for iOS and Android, and you just invoke that, and then you put in the VIN code so that if you do this to more than one vehicle, the data is attributable to each of the vehicles and not all just messed up. And you can do all kinds of interesting stuff, but you can interrogate the operator parameters of the vehicle in great detail, including the operating temperature of the transmission. And the final piece of advice I'd give to you if you're doing this, all right, is don't let the fascination with the data in real time, driving your chitois at 100 on a hot day, don't let that fascination overcome the imperative to pay attention and drive safely. Because we don't want you to have this FUN and wake up in the emergency department unable to feel your legs. You've got to prioritise safely over just watching endlessly the cascade of data being beamed to your phone by the blue buyer and via <laughs> the blue driver dongle. Get that right. One of the great automotive lies of the late 20th and early 21st century is sealed for life. Your transmission is sealed for life. And I'd suggest here we're looking at the victor in a war between marketing and economics and operating engineering reality, okay? And the way this plays out is that the marketing department wants to say things like maintenance-free transmission, and you, the buyer, often wants to go, well, I don't want to pay to change that transmission oil. Like, what benefit is that to me? That's just me paying the dealer more money. And then there's the reality, which is if you believe in this, your transmission will fail early in the majority of cases. So you can subscribe to this message, but do so at your own peril and know that if you do, it's going to cost you money. So I would suggest that as a default setting for average automatic transmission vehicles, I'd be changing the transmission fluid at 60,000 Ks or three years. And that's kind of, you can bend that a little bit because it's not based on uh, some sort of lengthy testing that I've done, but this advice is conservative. And if you wanna make it 50,000 Ks or two years, whatever, I'd suggest that the distance is more important than the years in this case, all right? And if you use your vehicle harshly, if it's a real severe use case, like you've done a lot of chitois towing, then you can just halve it to 30,000 Ks instead of 60, okay? And that's ultra-conservative as well. And there's a solid logical basis for doing that 
and the objective here is ultimately to save you money because it's a messy job doing this, okay? And it's better if you just give it to your mechanic because it's easier to manage up on the hoist. They've got to drop the whole pan. It's not just like changing the oil in an engine, which involves undoing the drain plug and taking the lid off the filler to give you the flow through. You've got to drop the whole pan and there's, it's hard to do. It's inconvenient, but not technically difficult. So just give it to the local mechanic to do, and he can do it easy, you know? The other times I'd strongly suggest you change your auto transmission fluid is day number one or thereabouts when you own a used car for the first time. So you go out, you pick up the used car of your dream, get a service done and include change the transmission fluid because, hey, you don't know whether the previous owner has subscribed to this or not. So you, you'd best do that. And then if you're going to do the trip preparation, you know, if you've just bought the chitois and you're going to go on the big lap or anything of that nature, just change the transmission fluid to give your transmission the best protection when it's going to be working the hardest for the longest period of time. And probably a good idea when you get back from all of that 12 months down the track or something, get your vehicle serviced and have the transmission fluid changed again. And then when the pain and suffering wears off and you want to do it all again, you're in the best position for just repeating this process and not being stopped on dingo piss flat with a transmission that's composed a lengthy letter to its barrister and then shat itself out all over the past 400 metres of road because that's really not fun. My central thesis here is that temperature kills transmissions. Over-temperature, excessive temperature kills transmissions and it does that because the temperature kills the oil. It diminishes its ability to lubricate the parts. It stops the parts from being separated. Mechanical wear goes through the roof. There's a loud noise and then deafening silence and a bill for 15 to 20 grand. And nobody wants that. So I did a whole bunch of research about what information is credible and available about the relationship between temperature and the kilometres that you can expect to get reliably out of oil in your transmission, okay? And the bottom line is that 80 degrees basically gives you this quasi-infinite life of the oil. Infinite meaning, you know, four laps of the planet, 160,000 Ks, that's a hell of a long way. Most transmissions operate hotter than 80, though. And for every 15 degrees C hike in operating temperature within about this range, there's a knock-on 50% reduction in the range that you can expect to get out of the oil and it still do its job. So, for example, if your transmission operates at 95, that will drop to 80,000. Quite safe still, right? And certainly within the recommendation for servicing back there, about 60,000 Ks or three years. But if you start to go over 95 or 100 degrees then you start to get at 110 into the 40,000 K sort of range. And then over 125 degrees C, there's just a whole bunch of lemmings go off the cliff and all bets are off. So these temperatures are interesting because at about 110, which is, let's face it, higher than the boiling point of water at one atmosphere, you're looking at things like the accelerated forming of varnish inside the transmission, that gummy sort of coating on everything that clogs passageways and generally interferes with flow and contaminates the crap out of things that you don't want the crap contaminated out of. And there's also uh, accelerated ke chemical degradation of the oil. It loses its lubricity faster and you don't want that all right and then when you get above about 125 degrees c that's really bad because the critical seals inside a conventional automatic transmission start to harden up and when they do that you lose pressure in the system and the risk of catastrophic failure through oil degradation and overheating and things of that nature really increase like you might get a whole bunch of slip in the clutches, all right? And when that happens, that's even worse because more heat gets generated as a result of the clutches slipping when they should not, and temperature goes through the roof and then failure becomes imminent. So you definitely don't want that. So I'd say that if you're looking at the data out of your little blue driver dongle thingo and you're getting spikes above 110 degrees, then that qualifies as severe. And at 110 degrees, we're looking at 40,000 Ks worth of oil endurance, which is why I said 
a page ago, basically to halve the servicing interval, right, to service at 30,000 instead of 60,000 for severe operating conditions, which would be essentially defined by 110. But the conservative mechanical engineer in me, which I've tried to eradicate but still exists, he's in there somewhere, says... It's easy to remember 100 because 100 is one of those magic numbers. If the oil goes above 100, halve the service interval, that's nice and conservative because we're up here at 60,000 or something. You might get 60,000 reliably, but if you change the oil at 30,000, that's a real hedge against any degradation that can't be foreseen in this kind of zone. So above 100, I'd be using 30,000 as the servicing frequency. And this is essentially the rationale that underpins the previous recommendation about that. 60,000 for easy use for your transmission, 30,000 for real hard use because degradation red zone imminent. My default advice about this stuff is, of course, most people don't need to fit an aftermarket transmission cooler. But you might if you're asking your car to do something specially hard, like tow the big three and a half ton Chitois in Australia at 50 degrees C through Tipperborough or some place of that nature, Broken Hill or something. It can be quite inhospitable. And the reason for this, the physics for this, is that dead brainiac Isaac Newton has a law of cooling named after him, which is essentially this. It says, a thing at a temperature loses heat to the environment at another temperature, and the rate of heat loss depends on the difference in temperature between the two things. The heat's only going to flow if the environment is cooler than the thing, obviously. If the thing is cooler than the environment, then obviously heat flows out of the environment into the thing, which is why your beer warms up on a hot day. And conversely, it's why your cup of tea or coffee cools down when you just stick it in the ambient environment. And if it's winter, it cools down faster than in the middle of summer, obviously, because the temperature differential is different, higher, when the environment is cooler and the heat loss is therefore quicker. It's also why human beings die in the snow because we lose heat too rapidly into the environment despite our vestigial fur which is a hedge of sorts a sort of evolutionary hedge against excessive convective cooling that causes hypothermia and kills us and it's why wolves and huskies and dogs of that nature have such thick fur all right um, it's also why we find it so damn difficult to stay at a decent temperature when the ambient environment exceeds about 37 or 38 degrees because it ends up being hotter than us and we have to sweat and evaporate and do all of that undignified stuff in order to maintain our core temperature. Okay, So Newton's law of cooling, you've experienced it and it affects your transmission because in Australia doing the Chitois shuffle at you know 100 k's an hour and the ambient temperature is 50 degrees C, that's not a real good environment for convective cooling of your transmission. Much better to have snow all the way around, which is sadly lacking in most of the nation. So if you've got an SUV, four-wheel drive, ute, whatever, with a transmission cooler, it generally works like this. It's in the bottom tank of your radiator, okay? And that's the cool tank because hot water comes in the top, falls through the core, cools down, goes in the bottom, gets collected and gets pumped back into the engine to do the whole thing again, to transport heat out of the engine, thanks to Newton's law of cooling. All right. The problem with this, of course, is that water's probably going in the radiator at about 100, 110 degrees, something of that nature. It's pressurised, so might as well take advantage of the higher temperature and higher boiling point to transport the maximum heat. And this can minimise the volume of water you need to do the job and the size of the radiator and all of these things. But the bottom tank is likely to be at something like 70, 80, 90 degrees C, something like, depends on the temperature of the environment and how hard you're working the engines, things like that. But let's say 80, automatic transmission fluid goes in through a pipe and it's just coiled in there like that to maximise the surface area and it bleeds heat into this water and that goes around and cools the engine, okay? So a couple of problems with that. The difference between 80 and 110, like the fluid's probably going in at 110, okay? The difference between 110 and 80 is not that great. So, frankly, not all that much heat can be lost. It's not 
a particularly brilliant way of cooling. All right. The other problem here is, of course, that if it's a really hot day, the whole system is stressed and the heat loss has to go somewhere. So the heat is being lost out of the fluid into the coolant in the radiator and going back into your engine, which on a 50 degree day, Australia, is really doing it tough. So it's imperfect at best. So if the data you collect suggests that you're routinely experiencing this warm side of 100 degrees C, okay, I'd strongly suggest finding the biggest air cooling oil cooler you can find. So like an independent aftermarket radiator for transmission fluid. And I'd stick it out there in the cooling airflow, right, right where the all of those other heat exchangers are, the radiator and all of the, you know, the condenser and your intercooler if you've got a turbo diesel, all of those things up the front in the airflow, put the cooler there where it does its maximum work because it gets access to the maximum flow. Get a professional to install it because you don't want the system to have any integrity problems. Otherwise, you will just pump transmission fluid out onto the road cue the $20,000 you know, repair bill, and nobody wants that. So get a professional to fit it, fit the biggest one you possibly can find to do the maximum work on the worst possible day, and then go back and run the experiment again and make sure that your tweak has actually achieved the desired result. Because on the worst day, you really want your transmission fluid not to operate in excess of 100, 105, certainly no hotter than 110. So at least that's a rational basis to proceed with this rather than just, you know, beard stroking and thinking it's a good idea and going out and doing it. And don't forget to confirm the results because you always want to know if your mod experiment, whatever you want to call it, your roll of the dice with your $20,000 repair bill, you want to make sure that your fix has been effective.